the physiological chemistry of semen in relation to the nutrition of the nervous system. The question whether the semen contains substances of physiological importance, and whether the withdrawal of these chemicals, through emissions or orgasms, can have any detrimental effect by lowering the concentration of these substances in the blood, is a question of much importance, and one which can be determined only by the methods of biochemistry correlated with clinical observations of the physiological effects of the orgasm. If the semen contains substances of little or no physiological value, there can be little or no harmful effects from its loss. But if, as we shall see, the chemicals of which it is composed are closely related to the chief constituents of nerve and brain tissue, consisting mainly of phospholipins, then the withdrawal from the circulation of these substances, through orgasms or involuntary emissions, must not be without detrimental effects affecting the nutrition of the nervous system and brain, resulting in altered functioning. It was the opinion of the older physiologists that the loss of seminal fluid, through masturbation, pollutions, or coitus, led to loss of nervous energy, and when frequently repeated, may cause disturbed functioning of the spinal cord and even the brain. We shall see, in the light of biochemistry, that there is, indeed, an intimate chemical relationship between the semen and the cells of the nerves and brain, and that it is, through this relationship, that seminal losses produce their neurological and psychic effects. That the semen and the brain are chemically very closely related, though analytically demonstrated very recently, has been surmised since ancient times. Alameon, a Pythagorean physician of antiquity, called the semen a portion of the cerebrum, Epicurus regarded the semen as part of the mind and soul. In more recent times, Hoffman, a physiologist, wrote, One easily understands why there is so intimate a connection between the brain and the testicles, since these two organs separate from the blood the most exquisite part of the lymph. <clears throat> the seminal fluid is distributed in all the nerves of the body. It seems to be of the same nature. That the semen contains substances of great importance for the nutrition of the central nervous system by the isolation of spermin as the active principle of testicular extracts by the Russian physiologist Pohl. Pohl found that when spermin was injected into animals, an increased rate of oxidation took place in all tissues, all metabolic processes being accelerated and nervous vitality being markedly increased. Since Schreiner, the discoverer of spermin, has shown in 1878 that it is a normal constituent of the semen, this clearly shows that the latter acts as a nerve stimulant, and most probably, in the light of the facts which we shall now consider a nerve food. Of interest in this connection is the remark by Havelock Ellis, that in some parts of Australia, natives administer a portion of semen to feeble and dying members of their tribe. An examination of the chemical composition of the semen and the central nervous system shows them to have a remarkable similarity in their constitution especially by reason of the fact that both contain larger quantities of lipoids, including lysophin and cholesterol and phosphorus, than almost all other parts of the body. The group of fats known as phospholipins are major constituents both of the semen and the brain. The most important among the phospholipins of which the brain is composed is lysophin, a compound of fat, phosphorus and nitrogen, which is a substance of the greatest importance the nutrition and maintenance of normal activity of nervous tissues. The only other parts of the body containing a concentration of lecithin approaching that of the brain are the sex glands, the semen, and the other endocrine glands, especially the pineal gland. Abda Holden, in his Physiological Chemistry, describes the distribution of lecithin as follows. It occurs particularly in animal tissues, in the brain, nerves, fish eggs, yolks of eggs, and in the spermatosa. The grey matter of the brain contains 17% lecithin, which is the essential and indispensable medium through which the higher intellectual processes manifest themselves. The greater the purity in which lecithin is found, the higher the intelligence of the animal, even in insects. 
The superior acuteness displayed, for instance, by bees and ants, is due to this fact. It is the quality of highly organized phosphorus compounds, as lecithin, which appears to be vitally connected with the intellectual processes. Lecithin can be formed from fruit sugar, which is the chemical basis of all fats. Being easily combustible and having a large amount of potential energy in a small volume, lecithin is well adapted to sustain the ceaseless activities of the nervous system and the respiratory organs. As oil burns in the fine ramifications of the wick, so does nerve oil or lecithin burn in the fine ramifications of the wick-like nerve fibres by means of oxygen. The only other part of the body which can compare with the brain and nerves in the high content of lecithin are the endocrine glands and the semen. The semen is quite rich in lecithin, which contributes to its fatty consistency. That considerable lecithin is required for the formation of spermatosa and ova is indicated by Maischer's observation that the amount of lecithin in the blood is increased during the period of formation of reproductive cells. The fat content of the human blood is about 2%. It is all present, either compounded with phosphorus, as the esters, grouped under the name of the lecithins, or combined with the waxy alcohols known as the cholesterols. The concentration of these substances in the blood can vary, depending on their intake and outgo. Thus, the eating of egg yolks can increase the concentration of both. Similarly, it is rational to suppose that seminal discharges can cause withdrawal of lecithin and cholesterol from the blood, since the semen is remarkably rich in both these substances, and its discharge is followed by the manufacture of the sex glands of new secretions whose raw materials are taken from the blood. Since lecithin and cholesterol are also chief constituents of the central nervous system, it is rational to suppose that seminal losses are able to lower the concentration in the blood sufficiently to cause nervous undernourishment. Manifesting in neurasthenia. This explains why German physicians are using lecithin tablets for the treatment of neurasthenia caused by sexual debility. Another characteristic similarity between the semen and the brain is the high content of phosphorus in both. Dr. L. Berman, biochemist, writes, One of the earliest discoveries about the chemistry of the brain showed that it yielded a large amount of phosphoric acid. Finer analysis proved that this phosphoric acid was present as phosphates, also as combinations of sugar and protein as nucleoproteins, also as compounds of proteins alone, phosphoproteins. It is mostly conjoined with the peculiar fat-like substances known as the lipins, or lipids. Of these, the cholesterols and the lecithins are the prototypes. Collectively, these compounds of phosphorus and the lipins are named the phospholipins. The lecithins are typically found in yolk of egg. The cholesterols were first discovered in gallstones. Upon the basis of the occurrence of so much phosphorus in the brain, Molloskot and Liebig popularized the epigram, there can be no thinking without phosphorus. Thus started the tradition that phosphorus and foods containing it are good for one who leads a brainy life. There can be no doubt that phosphorus has a definite relation to the chemical composition of the brain and its performances, but we must look for more specific information regarding the chemical compounds of phosphorus unique to the brain before we can begin talking about the value of it as a brain food. Solubility of their substances in alcohol and ether, rather than in water, distinguishes nerve tissue sharply from all others, most of the contents of which are water-soluble. It suggests that the properties characteristic of the brain are connected with the presence of these remarkable compounds of oxygen-poor fats with phosphoric acid, i.e. the phospholipins. That they increase in amount proportionally to the degree of complexity of the nervous system as it gets older and more learned also supports the view of their importance. According to Saju, the great biochemist and endocrinologist, lecithin is a conspicuous component of the brain, nerves, yolk of egg, and the semen. Now, since both the central nervous system and the sex glands obtain their lecithin from the supply existing in the blood, this would mean that excessive withdrawals of this substance by the latter, to replace discharged secretions, must deprive the brain and spinal cord of chemicals which are of the utmost importance for their normal nutrition and functioning. 
Might not neuroses and psychoses arise from diminished nutrition of nerve and brain centers due to excessive withdrawals from the blood of lesser filling cholesterol to replace expended sexual secretions? The tonic effects of lecithin upon the nerves would indicate that conservation of lecithin through continence is a therapeutic measure of primary importance in the treatment of such cases. That insanity might be due to a deficiency of lecithin and related substances as a result of lowered concentration of these chemicals in the blood is indicated by the observation of Lassane, who found a decreased quantity of lipoids and lecithin in the white brain matter of the insane. Commenting on this observation, Fischer, a French biochemist, says, The content of the brain in combined lipoids seems then to have some relation to intellectual power and to its modifications as well. Also, insanity due to alcohol has been shown to be definitely due to this cause, since alcohol is a lipoid solvent. It has been shown by experiment that in the series of agents which act as narcotics, the anesthetic power increases in proportion to the quantity of lipoids which the liquid's employ is capable of dissolving. Chloroform and ether both possess the property of dissolving lipoids, as was shown in 1905 by Overton, the discoverer of the lipoids. It has also been shown that after anesthesia, ether and chloroform accumulate in the nervous tissues. The experiments of Nicholas and Friesen have proven that the white matter of the brain, which contains twice as much lipoids as the grey, can fix twice as much chloroform. The deep unconsciousness following sexual activity may therefore be considered as analogous to that which follows the administration of the anaesthetic. In both cases, large quantities of lipoids are withdrawn from active use by the brain. Since both the brain and the sex organs extract identical chemicals from the blood as lecithin and cholesterol, this would mean that increased activity of one should involve decreased activity of the other, resulting from excessive withdrawal. The more lipoids that the sex glands withdraw from the blood, the less are available to the brain. This is confirmed by the observation of Darwin that the brain of rabbits diminish in size under domestication. It is well known that domesticated animals have much more frequent estuarial periods and are much more prolific than wild ones. The decreased size of the brain must be due to withdrawal of lipoids to replace expended secretions. Not only are the semen and the brain closely related by their high contents of lecithin and cholesterol, but also by their high contents of phosphorus. We have previously mentioned Lode's observation that the semen contains 30% phosphoric acid. Concerning the high content of phosphorus in the brain, Professor Matthews, in his Physiological Chemistry, writes, One of the most striking facts about the chemistry of the brain is the very large amount of phosphoric acid it contains. This fact was discovered very early, since in ashing the brain substance, some of the phosphoric acid is reduced and phosphorus remains. The phosphoric acid of the brain is partly free, partly in the form of phosphates, and partly in combination of nucleic acid, and as part of phosphoproteins. A large part of the brain's phosphorus, however, is present in the phospholipins, or phosphatides, lipoids, which it abundantly contains. Liebreich crystallized the importance of phosphorus in the brain in saying, Ohne Phosphor keine Gedanken. These considerations make it evident that withdrawal of lipoids, cholesterol, and phosphorus from the blood, through seminal discharges, must deprive the central nervous system of substances which are of the utmost importance for its nutrition. From this point of view, it is by all means probable that masturbation in early youth may seriously retard the development of the brain, as early writers have noted. The loss of corresponding quantities of lipoids, cholesterol, and phosphorus later in life, through coitus, does not have such a serious effect, since the brain is then not so plastic. Nevertheless, the nervous system is thereby definitely injured. Chakraborty writes, The loss of concentration of lecithin and phosphates becomes a serious drain on the nervous system. Lecithin and phosphates are the principal component elements in the structure of the brain. We must best close this discussion by the following statement by Berman, a biochemist. No one has yet isolated the various substances which make for the best metabolism of the nerve cells and their quickest recovery from fatigue. When these substances will be in our hands, the chemistry of the superman will be in view. The artificial creation of mentally superior human beings will then become the definitely achievable ultimate goal of chemistry. These substances to which Berman refers are by no means unknown. They are lecithin, cholesterol, and phosphorus. A maximum supply of these substances is made available for the central nervous system when a minimum quantity is withdrawn from the sex glands. 
A maximum supply of these substances is made available for the central nervous system when a minimum quantity is withdrawn by the sex glands. Consonance, therefore, means a higher concentration of lecithin, cholesterol, and phosphorus in the blood. That the enrichment of the blood with testicular secretions has a stimulating effect upon metabolic processes in nerve cells has been proven by Brown Saccard. Chakraborty says that the eating of desiccated testicles has a stimulating effect on the central nervous system due to the nucleoalbumins, lecithin, and phosphorus in which they are so rich, and which are also prominent constituents of nervous tissues. Havelock Ellis writes that in some parts of Australia, natives administer a portion of semen to feeble and dying members of their tribe. According to Fisher, the sex glands may be considered as reservoirs of lipoids, which then release, which, when released into the blood, energize the brain. Writing on the resorption of semen, Havelock Ellis says, The positive action of semen, or rather of the testicular products, has been much investigated during recent years, and appears on the whole to be demonstrated. The notable discovery by Brown Saccard, a quarter of a century ago, that the injection of the testicular juices in states of debility and senility acted as a beneficial stimulant and tonic, opened the way to a new field of therapeutics. Many investigators in various countries Many investigators in various countries have found that testicular extracts, and more especially the spermin, as studied by Pohl, and by him regarded as a positive catalysator or accelerator of metabolic processes, and by him regarded as a positive catalysator or accelerator of metabolic processes, exert a real influence in giving tone to the heart and other muscles, and in improving the metabolism of the tissues, even when all influences of mental suggestion have been excluded. There is, however, another use which is subserved by the testicular products, a use which may indeed be said to be implied in those uses to which reference has already been made, but is yet historically the latest to be realised and studied. It was not until 1869 that Brown Saccard first suggested that an important secretion was elaborated by the ductless glands and received into the circulation, but that suggestion proved epoch-making. If these glandular secretions are so valuable when administered as drugs to other persons, must they not be of far greater value when naturally secreted and poured out into the circulation in the living body? It is now generally believed, on the basis of a large and various body of evidence, that this is undoubtedly so. In a very crude form, indeed, this belief is by no means modern. In opposition to the old writers, who were inclined to regard the semen as an excretion which it was beneficial to expel, there were other ancient authorities who argued that it was beneficial to retain it as being a vital fluid which, if reabsorbed, served to invigorate the body. The great physiologist Hula, in the middle of the 18th century, came very near to the modern doctrine when he stated in his Elements of Physiology that the sperm accumulated in the seminal vesicles is pumped back into the blood, and thus produces the beard and the hair together with the other surprising changes of puberty which are absent in the eunuch. The reabsorption of semen can scarcely be said to be part of the modern physiological doctrine, but it is at least now generally held that the testes secrete substances which pass into the circulation and are of immense importance in the development of the organism. We see, therefore, how extremely important is the function of the testes. Its significance is not alone for the rays. It is not simply concerned with the formation of the spermatosa, which share equally with the ova and the honour of making the mankind of the future. It also has a separate and distinct function which has reference to the individual. It elaborates those internal secretions which stimulate and maintain the physical and mental characters, constituting all that is most masculine in the male animal, all that makes the man in distinction from the eunuch. Among various primitive peoples, including those of the European race, whence we ourselves spring, the most solemn form of oath was sworn by placing the hands on the testes, dimly recognised as the most sacred part of the body. A crude passing phase of civilization has ignorantly cast ignominy upon the sexual organs, the more primitive belief is now justified by our advancing knowledge. Ellis, Studies in the Psychology of Sex.